Hi everyone! It's been a few days actually, but I'm just going to continue talking about all the books that I read in 2021. Clearly I wasn't focusing on favorites. I was probably equally talking about everything unless I just didn't have that much to say, but I'll be sure to point out the favorites. So, the next book that I have to talk about is a favorite, Hell House by Richard Matheson. This I listened to on audiobook. This is the one, yeah, that I found on YouTube actually. So I will link that audiobook in the description and in the card. It will be at least in the description. It was narrated by Ray Porter, who will actually come up again, and he did a really good job. There's a handful of characters, and he did a really good job of distinctly having a voice for all of them. I think it helps that there's only like a handful of characters, but still, like, I wasn't confusing anybody and he really helped their personalities come out. So Hell House is about the Belasco house in a way. That's where it takes place. That is the house that has been deemed Hell House. And um, I will admit I don't remember characters' names, so I'm just going to kind of give you an idea of who the characters are. Because I don't have this book physically and I listen to it on audiobook, the names have just been wiped from my memory right now. <laughs> I would like to get this book as well as check out other things by Richard Matheson. So this is a haunted house story. You may be somewhat familiar with it if you know the movie The Legend of Hell House from 1973, I'm pretty sure. And this I think was from 1971 if I am remembering those correctly. So Hell House has to do with a doctor, Barrett, Dr. Barrett, okay, I remember his name, and he is trying to prove that Hell House is not haunted, that there are scientific uh, reasons as to why, what is causing this so-called haunting. And I'm not sure how many years previously, but a good number of years ago, there was another group of people who were essentially doing the same thing, or at least studying the activity at the house, and Dr. Barrett is bringing along his wife, as well as one of the, I think, the only surviving member um, of that group who had previously been at the Belasco house. Obviously, things went awry, and people died. <laughs> that man is also a very well-known psychic, and there's also another psychic, but um, sort of more... There's like a difference between the, the way that they go about their abilities, but there's also a young woman who is a psychic who um, Dr. Barrett brings along. So it's, oh my god, is it just the four of them? <laughs> I guess so. Why was I thinking there's another character? I mean, there is, um, it's all being allowed by the person who like owns the house. So they go to Hell House and things start happening. And this, I really recommend the audiobook, by the way, um, as long as you can handle it, I guess. <laughs> I don't recommend listening to this with other people around, at least out loud, because it is very vulgar. Oh my god. That's why I looked up when it was written and when the, um, when the film adaptation came out, because the Legend of Hell House is actually not as vulgar as it could be, and I think this would make a really good, like, source, good source material for another adaptation, if that was ever in the works. I think it would be really good. I think that you could do a lot with it now, um, not only just visually, but also with going as far as it does in terms of the just, like, grotesque and... I don't, vulgar is like the most accurate word that I can think of, honestly. Just like the words that come out of these people's mouths when the house is influencing them, when spirits are influencing them. Good God. <laughs> um, which is, God is not there. God is not there. It is... Well, I mean, it's called Hell House. What am I even thinking? <laughs> And I think this was just really succinct in what haunted house stories do. You get a lot of background information on Belasco and how this house has become so legendary and uh, reasons as to why maybe there are spirits inhabiting it or 
you know, it's a haunted, it is haunted in some capacity. And then when the group is there, they all have distinct personalities and uh, their own sort of ideas and faith. And then that just is corrupted by the end of it because of the way the house is. Because Belasco was really depraved. I have talked about this before, haven't I? I am hearing words in my head again. <laughs> like, I feel like I'm repeating things. But Belasco was very depraved and that has seeped into the spirit of the house, if you could call, if you could say a house has a spirit. The, it is just an overall depraved entity around, surrounding the house. Lots of <laughs> hand motions here. Yeah, I like backstory information. I like a lot of like crazy things happening, scary things happening when uh, the characters are there to witness the hauntings, the happenings, what, whatever you want to call it. And obviously, uh, Dr. Barrett is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> There's a reason for all of this. I have this machine. So, yes. Cool. I thought it was great. I definitely don't think it's for everyone, but I really enjoyed it and I really liked listening to it. Uh, definitely the type of story that I think is good for an audiobook as well. And then we have a few short stories by Edgar Allan Poe. So uh, there's William Wilson, which has... Uh, I, these are so hard to talk about because they're, like, extremely short. William Wilson has to do with a man going back to his... Going through his past and how there's this other kid who went to school with him, also named William Wilson, who also looked very much like him and acted like him and tried to be, like, the superior William Wilson. And so it kind of goes through that, how this other William Wilson has come and gone in... The main character's life. Then there's Lygia, which most people are probably familiar with because of the Tomb of Lygia, which is um, a Vincent Price, Roger Corman Poe adaptation. That one has to do with a man who thinks that his dead wife is still alive. I, that's probably enough there. <laughs> and then The Fall of the House of Usher. I feel like most people know this one. It is a favorite story of mine, probably one of my favorite short stories, and it was a highlight of these books as well, just because I hadn't read it in a really long time. Also, I did not realize how short it is. It's like 12 pages, I think. There were a number of these that I actually don't have, which is I'm not why I'm not holding up anything. I think the next one is the only one that I own, and it's just under a pile of books, and I just don't want to get it. <laughs> so, Paul the House of Usher has to do with the Usher family and a man getting a letter from an old school, like, not even friend, but just an acquaintance, essentially, Madeline and, oh man, I almost had it, Roderick Usher. Yes, they are twins, and Roderick writes to this old school acquaintance um, asking him to come, <laughs> to come to the house. And it has to do with, like, the family of the House of Usher. Hard to talk about when things are so short, but it's, again, I think it's something that a lot of people are familiar with. And then the last one is the facts in the case of Monsieur Valdemar. Valdemar, right? Yes. Sorry, I have um, candles <laughs> holding up these pieces of paper so they don't fall because they kept falling last time and the candle was in the way. But anyway, this one, really creepy actually. I don't think I had read this one before. Lygia, I wasn't sure about, and this one, I didn't really, oh no wait, because I have read that, this is one that I own, and I have read that book. I just really didn't remember it then. This one has to do with a man who wants to know what like the afterlife is like, and he hypnotizes someone before they die. So they are like forever hypnotized and in this state of in between. Honestly horrific as I'm thinking about it, by the way. Yeah, I think that's something that Edgar Allan Poe kind of excels at. Like it's very spooky and atmospheric and like horrific to think about when you're reading it and as you're reading it if you're like really into the story. But it's also something that I think once it kind of lingers and you're thinking about it after the fact and maybe envisioning it more, 
that's what is like truly horrific about his stories, in my opinion. And then we have the narrator Ray Porter coming up again because I also listened to the audiobook of The Amityville Horror by Jay Anson. And this was disappointing. I just think that it didn't help that I listened to Hell House and then I listened to The Amityville Horror. And because they're both, you know, haunted house stories, which happened to be narrated by the same person, I think in a way that was almost helpful because he was obviously approaching each book differently, but I'm sure he has the same sort of like method. I think that actually like kind of helped in terms of comparing, but the comparison overall was not great just because of how much I enjoyed Hell House and then the Amityville Horror was just kind of disappointing. I just feel like there wasn't that much that had to do with the house. It was just things that happened. I don't know, things that happened. I don't know. It just wasn't very good. Characters were in the house and then something would happen, but then it took them a moment for them to realize that it was something odd or something that had to do with this presence in the house. It seemed much more about the family being in the house than like the haunting itself or like figuring out what was happening. Especially because there are like some priest characters and of course the, the father of the, the family who moves into the house. I'm literally, I'm assuming that you kind of know the premise. <laughs> I realized I just started talking about it and didn't give you sort of context here of a family moves into a house and it's haunted. The father of the family has put, I mean, the, the family, they've put like all their money in this house. And the father specifically is adamant about like nothing bad being there or, or any sort of like weird feeling or he just makes excuses for a lot of things until it fully sort of hits him and then they feel like they have to get out. And meanwhile, there are priests and other people in the neighborhood who are like, yeah, we don't go near that house. Like, no, there's a bad, bad vibes there. I don't know how many movies of the franchise I've seen, but I know that I've seen the original movie and the remake, the one with Ryan Reynolds. Honestly, also the details have just gone from my mind because I just feel like I didn't really care as much. I wasn't enjoying it as much when I was reading it, but it's only like six hours or something like that. And then I also had it sped up because it's really slow when you watch things or listen to things on one point speed. Yeah, disappointing. Okay, then next we have three favorites in a row. They're all right here. One, two, three. There's a really small one there. So here we go. Tess of the Dervervilles by Thomas Hardy. I'm so glad that I enjoyed this. Is this blurry? Does this look blurry? Okay, anyway, Tess of the Dervervilles, you guys. I am so glad I enjoyed this because I have read Far From the Madding Crowd, also by Thomas Hardy, and I liked it, but I didn't like really enjoy the process of reading it, and I was kind of worried that that would continue with other Hardy works. A lot of people that I watch on booktube talk about his writing, um, with just how visceral it is, just ha him like having great imagery, and I just didn't get that. But then I watched the, what is it, 2015 film adaptation, and I was like, oh, like the cinematography I feel like translated Thomas Hardy's writing really well from book to screen, from page to screen. I was like, okay, I get it. If this is what people are thinking about in terms of Thomas Hardy's writing, like I get it visually with the film adaptation, the 2015 film adaptation, because there are, there are multiple. And I enjoyed this one. <laughs> that was just my uh, experience, I guess, with Far From the Madding Crowd. Um, I, I do like the story of that one as well. But Tess is so good. I don't even know how I can begin to explain this one or like talk about it because I definitely recognized it as a favorite of the year and possibly, like, all three of these, I think, the next, this one and the next two, are kind of like, are these also favorite books of mine overall? Um, I've become pretty lenient lately, I feel like, with ratings and adding things to, like, favorite lists, um, like, my favorites list. On Letterboxd, I've been giving out a lot of, like, four and a half stars, which usually I don't do that much. I really don't. And I'm like really precious about five out of five stars on Letterboxd. Yeah, I did give this on Goodreads. You can't do half stars on Goodreads. I gave it a four out of five. It's definitely closer to like a 4.5. I think that I 
took my time with it, which in a way helped, but also there was a little bit of time there where it was like, oh, I might have waited too long to like really get back into it. But as soon as I started reading, pretty much the whole time, it was like, all right, yes, here we are. This is what's just happened. And I love when that happens. Also, like, every chapter ended with just, like, something happened. Oh, I swear to God. Every, every chapter ends with something happening. And you're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's either good or bad. But probably bad because it's Thomas Hardy. And he just wants to rip your heart out. And Tess goes through the ringer in this. Oh my goodness gracious. I have not watched the film adaptation yet. Um, I have the 70 something adaptation, the Criterion release. It's, I'm gonna cry so much. <laughs> I already know it. Did I cry in the book? I think I did. I think I did. <sighs> it's a journey. It's a journey. So it's obviously, it's about Tess of the D'Urbervilles. Tess is the main character and her father finds out what is it's like Durbayfield Dur Durbayfield or something like that is Tess's like actual last name but then like on his drunken way home her father finds out from someone else in the neighborhood who has been doing research on like families or something like that. He has found out that the Durbayfield uh, sorry if I'm like pronouncing it weird, I'm just like <laughs> differentiating, but he, he found out that that line, that family line, goes back to the Durber fields, which descends from like knights, from noble knights, from nobility. This changes the way that Mr. Durbayfield like thinks about himself. He's like, we are, we are from nobility. This means that Tess, our eldest daughter, must find others of our, of our family and try to get in good graces with those who have remained of higher stature. And that's what she is set to do, and that's what she does. But something happens that forever changes the course of her life. And... Do I even... <laughs> How much do I go into? Definitely, you know, honestly, there's something that happens early on. <laughs> there's a lot of things that happen. Okay. But there's something that happens early on that I actually didn't pick up as much. Like if I didn't already know that that was the premise, which I'm kind of alluding right now, I don't think I would have picked up on it as distinctly as it should be, if that makes sense. So like I want to say trigger warning, look into it, but also I barely picked up on it and I'm not sure if I would have even equated what happened and fully recognized it if I didn't already know. Um, I will mention other characters and I realize that the context is not going to be there. I think that's all I'm going to say in terms of the overall plot synopsis. I may say like a few other things, but just the journey that Tess goes on and especially towards the end, it just, towards the end and then also since I finished it, I just keep thinking about Tess and how much of a great character she is. Like, she just really sticks to her morals and her ideas, but also she's very swayed. Like, in a way, she's swayed by other things. <laughs> it's... <laughs> I, re I recognize that that's kind of, like, opposing, but she really thinks about things and takes them into account and tries to evaluate what that means for her morals and the way that she is reflected. It's not, oh my, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. Not even just how she is reflected, how others around her are reflected. This girl is the most selfless girl I have ever, like, most selfless protagonist I've ever encountered, I think. An angel? Okay, let's talk about angel, maybe. I keep going back and forth on him because I really liked him, but then he was saying things and doing things that I really hated, especially because I loved Tess. I don't, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> um, I also annotated this like quite a lot. I didn't really write in the, did I? I think I did write some things. Oh yeah, I was predicting, I was like, oh no, it's going to go this direction, isn't it? But there was a lot of um, passages, like just this whole page, the entire page of page 357 in my edition. 
sorry, can you see like that line there? I start to make brackets like this down here. And then it was just like, no, I like all of this. Oh man, oh yes, and an Angel's family? Oh my gosh. I am already looking forward to rereading this. I'm not a big rereader. I've always wanted to do more rereading. I'm also like afraid to just continue talking about this because I will continue talking about it for a significant length of time. And that's probably, that's probably okay, right? Especially because I don't actually want to go into spoilery information. Tess the Durbervilles. And then, again, another favorite. The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter. Oh my gosh. I think I like her writing better than Shirley Jackson's. They get a lot of comparison just because they're both female authors who take towards the gothic. I found Angela Carter's writing, though, to be a lot more, mm, not necessarily on the grotesque side, but, <laughs> I don't know, like this, like kind of icky and slimy and, but like in a good way, like it works for the stories. I just feel like enveloped by something, like a weird, strange presence, I'm in the mist, in the forest. <laughs> That's that's the vibes that I get from Angela Carter. So this is a collection of short stories. There's oh by the way, I totally misread the I I don't remember what video it was in, but I listed out all of the oh it was my my my, blah, 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 <laughs> my like fall TBR or like books that I was thinking about reading in the fall. And uh I listed all the short stories. And I said the Airy King. The elves look really a lot like, um, the elves and eyes look very similar. It's, it's the Earl King, by the way. <laughs> Oops. In this, there's an introduction. Oh my gosh, wait, I have to see what the introduction is by. It's so good. It gave such insight to what I could expect from... Angela Carter's stories and writing, but also it had a lot of quotes from, okay, maybe not a lot, but a good number of quotes from Angela Carter kind of explaining um, certain things. It's by Helen Simpson, written in 2006. Let me, it also goes into the film adaptation a little bit because there is The Company of Wolves, which is one of the short stories in here. The, the film is called The Company of Wolves and it includes the Company of Wolves and a few of the other stories intertwined in that adaptation. In the introduction here it says, The Bloody Chamber is often wrongly described as a group of traditional fairy tales given a subversive feminist twist. In fact, these are new stories, not retellings. As Carter made clear, quote, My intention was not to do versions, or as the American edition of the book said horribly, adult fairy tales, but to extract the latent content from the traditional stories and to use it as the beginnings of new stories." End of quote. And just reading that, like, that is how I've, I've heard the Bloody Chamber pitched, like, adult fairy tales. And in the introduction, she's like, that's not what this is. <laughs> so I'm glad that this was made clear to me and available. So easily like right in the front here um and actually I don't like to read introductions before reading the book and I'm surprised now that I actually did but it definitely seemed like it was going to be more about Angela Carter as well as I would have stopped reading if I came across too many spoilers because introductions of classics spoil the book quite often Tip, <laughs> be wary of reading introductions of classics. And technically this isn't like too much of a classic. I think it's from the 70s, so. Um, anyway, I wanted to tell you which ones were my favorites. So um, the introduction is spectacular, definitely. Um, I don't know if it's in other editions, but this is the vintage classics edition that I have. It is a hardback book, but I think that they also have a paperback version. I'll just tell you my favorites. I start, I, <laughs> there's so many. There's just three stories that I didn't put a star next to. Um, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there's ten. Um, I gave half stars. Just, um, here, I'll just show you. Like, this is how I was keeping track. Um, 
So now I can open it and see, okay, which ones did I love and which ones did I just really like? And then which ones were just fine? So if I don't have anything next to it, it was just fine. Um, but I enjoyed the other ones more. How much more? Depends on if I gave it like half of the star or a full one. The Bloody Chamber, The Earl King, The Snow Child, The Lady of the House of Love, and Wolf Alice were my five favorites. <laughs> I recognize that that's half of the book, but um, those were my favorites and I couldn't, I couldn't choose any less than that. And then The Courtship of Mr. Lion and The Werewolf are the two other stories that I gave like half a star just in the way that I was writing it in the contents here. In actual rating I have no idea what I would rate any of these. <laughs> Probably The Bloody Chamber definitely five out of five. That one was for sure my favorite. Um, it's hard to talk about this because there are ten stories but The Bloody Chamber is the one by the way that has to do with Bluebeard. This is definitely one that you should probably read my Goodreads review for. I don't think it's that long but I do go into differentiations a little bit more. I really like Angela Carter's writing and I have since bought like two other books by her. I know one is a short story collection but I'm not sure about the other. I just want to read everything from her. But I mean I also want to read everything from Shirley Jackson. I'm not knocking Shirley Jackson by the way. I just know that they get a lot of comparison and I guess Shirley Jackson, I'm sorry, I guess Angela Carter also gets a lot of comparison to Flannery O'Connor, I think? Flannery O'Connor? No, 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 no. Iris Murdoch. <laughs> Those aren't even close. Those are not even close. How did I... <laughs> it's Iris Murdoch. Okay. <laughs> I haven't read anything from Iris Murdoch. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> How did I possibly... I, I think it's because... I said Flannery O'Connor because there is a collection of fairy tales um, by Angela Carter that have a similar cover to a Flannery O'Connor collection. And so that's what I was thinking. And then I was like, no, 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 that's not right. Um, yeah, I learned Iris Murdoch and Angela Carter got a lot of um, comparisons, I guess, according to a podcast that I was listening to, specifically an episode about the Bloody Chamber. Um, there's like a few podcasts that I listen to that have to do with books and I like listening to episodes of those if I've read the book and then obviously after I read a book I'll see if they have episodes on that. I don't know what else to say but it was so good and also I decided to buy this for my cousin for Christmas because I think that she would like them. Oof. The imagery, the diction, just absolute such good description. If you're if you're not into description, this is not going to be for you. But I I love poetic lyrical writing. Yeah. Also, mm, there are some things in here that are uncomfortable. I get, yes, definitely. Um I mean, all of her main characters in the stories are young female protagonists who there's a lot of uh like symbolism with womanhood and becoming a woman and menses. So there are some like sexual things in here, but also even more in particular, I think it's the snow child. Yeah, it's very short. I mean, I swear that one's like five pages or something like that. Should I just say it? It's very strange. <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, I'll just say it. No, oh, I can't say it. I'm on YouTube. I mean, I'm not monetized anyway, so I guess I'll say it, but in the snow child, spoiler alert, but also sort of trigger warning, there, there is a sexual assault of a corpse, but also, <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing. How do I describe it? Oh, the Earl King was so good. The forest imagery was so beautiful. I'm sorry. Oh, wait, I was literally just on the page. Oh my god, it's two pages. This is it. The snow child is two pages? No wonder it, I had such a hard time finding it. Sexual assault, I guess? Strange. The whole- it's not- the whole thing is not about that event, but I feel like I should mention that it's there. And then we have another play, and that is Tea and Sympathy by Robert Anderson. Again, this was a favorite. I just was really wrapped up in it. This has to do with- okay, thank god there are characters here. <laughs> Let me just go to the cast page, though. Tom. 
Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Tom is, oh my God, wait, how old are they? <laughs> they're at, they're a high school age, right? Oh my God. So I don't remember if it's exactly clear, but I think that um, the boys in this story are, oh my God, wait, are they in college or high school? But this mostly has to do with Tom, who is seen with one of his um, teachers at the beach, nude. And this starts a rumor that Tom is gay. And in a way, the other boys that he goes to school with think there's also, like, other evidence that supports this. Like, he, he walks, like, lightly on his feet. Um, he's not interested in the same kind of, like, manly things <laughs> that the other guys are. And that, that's, like, a lot of what this play is about, is just, like, misogyny and the patriarchy and really, Tom is actually in love with Laura, the headmaster, no, not headmaster, um, but, like, her, his, like, one of his professors, but also the, like, teacher assigned to that boarding house. Bill, his name is Bill, um, I, I'm not gonna bother with his last name, but Bill is a professor and the head of the boarding house and his wife is Laura and Tom is in love with Laura. So he spends a lot of time just like helping Laura garden or having tea with her or other things that seem sort of like more feminine, but really he's just like in love with her <laughs> that other people are oblivious to it. He also plays female roles in plays because they go to an all-boys school <laughs> and someone has to play the female parts, he takes them. He's, he has them. And so Laura also does like the fittings for his dresses for when they perform. So um, Laura and Tom get to spend a lot of time with each other and Tom has fallen in love with Laura. But then this rumor gets started and Tom starts questioning himself and the way that he acts and the way that others treat him. It takes a little bit of time for that to sort of start to get to him because he knows that he's not gay and he is in love with Laura, but it gets to his father and his father is like really questioning everything and is like, no, he has to not be in these plays and not play the female roles and he's going out for sports and, and things like that. But then also, well, I won't say that part, but there's, there's more characters that are involved including the ones that I listed, where other other things happen with them. And I was just like really caught up in it. And this is the kind of thing that I just like the sort of discussion of as well, the social constructs of like gender roles. And I really liked it, yeah. Then we have another audiobook, and that is The Seance by John Harwood. This was narrated by three people, Fiona Hardingham, Simon Vance, and Catherine Kelgren. 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 I liked this. It was good for October. It held my attention and interest and it was entertaining. I liked, I don't know which woman did which role, but whoever did, <laughs> oh man, I should have looked up more for the audiobooks because I don't remember character names. Um, I really don't at all. I barely remember what this one is about because it was just like an experience to listen to and I was into it and then it was over and then I was like, okay, I'm moving on now. But it's a like gothic Victorian story, not actually written in the Victorian era, but that's where it's set. Uh, that's when it's set. And it has to do with a woman, a young woman who her sister died at a really young age and her mother has never gotten over it. And she's always wanted to bring some sort of solace to her mother. So she decides to, um, and she becomes interested in psychics and mediums and... I mean, yeah, I mean, it's called a seance, so, like, people who perform seances. And she's always felt that she was a little different. She thinks that she was, like, a foundling, and her parents never told her. She feels connected to the people who are doing the seances, and she learns some things from, from one of the women. And through certain connections there, she is approached by someone who thinks she is connected to a different family. And through that, she 
we are ventured into this other family and like how they may be connected. <laughs> Goodness gracious. So there's like the main character and then we go back and follow a different female character and whoever played her did a really good job because she, she was just doing a lot with her voice. I don't know, again, I don't know if it's the Fiona Hardingham or Catherine Kelgren um, narrator, but she was just, she was doing the most, but in a really good way. It wasn't like, all right, lady, chill out. It was like, oh, nice. Like she's performing in a way that is enhancing the audiobook. And then also there's a part where one of the characters, <laughs> yeah, the plot's definitely gone from my mind a bit, but, um, at one point, a male character has to tell his story a bit, and that is um, narrated by Simon Vance, who I said before would come back because he, of course, is the narrator of a good number of the Cro uh, Vampire Chronicle audiobooks. He's Louis and Lestat. And it was just really weird to hear his voice. Thankfully, his part is like the shortest. Oh yes, he's like the in-between character. Yeah, he's the male, he's the man who comes and to the main character and is like, well, here's my story, and here's how it may connect with this story, which you have to, like, read, basically, is what happens. Again, good, enjoyable, wasn't a favorite necessarily, but, I mean, I have it on audiobook, so I can see myself, like, re-listening to it, especially to, like, really get into the spooky October mood. You know what I mean? Okay, we have two more audiobooks. So next is Pandora by Anne Rice. This is the sixth book overall in the Vampire Chronicles, but it is the first book in the New Tales of the Vampire series that they try to do at some point. There's only this and one other, and then they're like, no, we're just integrating all this into the Vampire Chronicles. It is what it is. And we got to learn more about Pandora, which was great. I don't know. I, it's hard to say because Pandora is not necessarily a favorite character of mine. But I also feel like maybe she has more to play later on. I can't think of more significant things that she does like within the first three books of the series. But this certainly uh, gives us an indication as to how she's connected to certain characters, obviously. Because it's like how she becomes a vampire and her, her life before she was one. It was so interesting though, that now that I think about it, it's so odd to have this story. So she um, is a character from like ancient Greek and Roman times of like before Caesar, right? Again, I don't have the book physically, so I don't. Settings, characters, certain plot points are always going to be less prominent in my mind with audiobooks because I don't have the book physically. All right, I guess I should say if I don't have a book physically, because there are, may be also cases, I mean, the next book that I'm going to read is The Vampire Armand, and I have that book physically, so I can actually listen to the audiobook while I read it. I'm very excited to do that, especially I have not physically read an Anne Rice book yet. Oh my gosh, I can annotate. <laughs> Exciting. She's from ancient Roman times, so it was just interesting to have that as a different setting for a vampire. A vampire book overall, but also a book from the Vampire Chronicles, of course. Oh man, one of her brothers too? What an asshole. <laughs> um, and we get more glimpses at Marius. Oh, you know, ever since I watched Queen of the Dam, I've really been mixing up Marius and Magnus. Magnus... Magnus is dead, right? He's... I have to double check. I will insert if this is correct or not. I think Magnus is the one who makes Lestat and then just offs himself. <laughs> and then Marius is the one Marius takes out, um, takes care of Akasha and Uncle. Uncle? I can't say his name right. Onkil? I don't know. <laughs> um, and I literally listened to the audiobooks for these. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah is Marius. We get more information on Marius, who I don't think has his own book. Maybe he does and it's just called something. I think I think he does. Mm -hmm. I don't know which one it is, but it's just titled something different. Unlike The Vampire Lestat and Pandora and The Vampire Armand. So anyway, Pandora, it was good. I am very glad to continue with The Vampire Chronicles. 
I'm so sad that Anne Rice died. And then I listened to Passing by Nella Larson. This was narrated by Tessa Thompson, who plays um, one of the main characters in the new movie. It's on Netflix. It's a really good adaptation, I think. Uh, very well done. And I really liked the book as well. It's, it's a novella, so it's pretty short. And this has to do with Irene and Claire. And Irene is nicknamed Reenie. Her and Claire were sort of childhood friends, or more so acquaintances in a way, but Claire has really fond memories of Irene, and one day, it takes place in the 20s, by the way, oh my god, the 20s? And one day, Irene is at a sort of lounge, day room kind of area, um, and it's, it's one for all whites. Because, of course, segregation was happening at this time, and she is someone who is light-skinned enough that she can pass as white um, when she kind of wants to or can. Both her and Claire can pass. But Claire decided a number of years ago that she, won um, she had family members who had died, and she decided to marry someone who didn't know her and uh, didn't know her background. So she married a white man and is passing for, a, as a white woman, and Irene, um, even though she can pass, I don't, I don't know if I want to say, like, to an extent, because I, th I guess if, if she's presented as white, then people would believe her to be white, but if she wasn't presented, um, and introduced as in that way, then maybe not? I don't, I'm just thinking about the way that, like, T Tessa Thompson said in an interview, um, she was, like, really pointing out this opening scene, in a way, with Irene being at an all-white, you know, day room lounge bar place <laughs> in the middle of the day. Anyway, so Claire and, um, Irene end up reconnecting, and Claire very much interjects herself into Irene's life, and Irene is kind of not having it. Um, but there's a lot more that's incorporated within the story. I feel like it's best to go into it just interpreting it the way that you end up doing and then hearing other people's thoughts and interpretations and the ways that there are there are different things that you can focus on. Of course, there are racial tensions and race it, it it's written by um, a black woman who, um, I think herself could pass, if I'm not mistaken. But also, there's a lot of, like, comparison that she does between herself and Claire and the life that they each have. There's also a little bit of jealousy with the attention that Claire gets, and at some point she thinks that Claire is sleeping with her husband, who I think is a really interesting character. There are certain things that I picked up on that I have not really heard that many people talk about. I think just because of how much focus is really on Irene and Claire. I was kind of going off on some other things that are integrated into the story, but I'll, I think I'll just say that there's like a lot of subtext that you can pick up on in various areas. It's a short novella, but there's still like a lot to it. Okay. Oh my god, we're almost done, you guys. <laughs> So then, we have Sweet Bird of Youth and Other Plays by Tennessee Williams. This also includes uh, two other plays along with Sweet Bird of Youth, and they are Period of Adjustment and The Night of the Iguana. Uh, I didn't like any of these as much as I liked the previous collection, but these were definitely still, like, all on par with each other, I feel like. I think I'll just tell you, like, the synopsis for the most part and not necessarily go into my own thoughts. So, Sweet Bird of Youth, this is the one where the character who is struggling with the idea of aging uh, is the male, actually, here. Chance, his name is Chance, played by Paul Newman in the film adaptation. And Chance has come back to his hometown where he's always wanted to, like, make a name for himself and then come back to town and be like, see, this is where I am. I am important and I am great and you should all love and admire me. He loves Princess, who is daughter of a very important businessman in town. And when they catch wind, when um, the father and other people in town catch wind that Chance is back in town, they try to get him to leave, 
uh, because of something that happened with Princess earlier, like the last time that he was visiting. And he's there with an actress who thinks that she's kind of like washed up because of something that happened and she's kind of been like in hiding ever since. And Chance is essentially blackmailing her to get her to give Chance and Princess an opportunity to come into money and win a fake contest that, like a contest that they just plan on completely rigging so that Chance and Princess can run away together and be successful as he wants to be an actor. So it has to do with that. <laughs> but obviously, as it goes with plays, there's a lot of information that certain characters don't know, that they find out about, and that you as an audience member find out about. And then period of adjustment has to do with two couples. One is a newly married couple, and one they've been married for a handful of years, and they're both going through a period of adjustment. <laughs> it literally says that a handful of times in the play. George and Ralph were in the Korean War together and so they're like old war buddies and George is coming to Ralph's because he like quit his job and he plans on, uh, they had like a plan that they had talked about when they were in the war together and now George wants that to like finally happen and he also has some um, other ideas in terms of altering it a bit. George is the one who is newly married to is Isabel um, and Ralph is married to Dorothea or Dory I think is what they she has a nickname but I think her name is Dorothea who's like barely in it to be honest. She's left Ralph earlier in the play and it's Christmas I think it's Christmas Eve and Ralph is saying that they are going to get a divorce because she walked out on him and they have a young boy who Ralph is concerned is becoming a sissy because he likes dolls and I'm th those are his words by the way I'm not saying that and the trouble with Isabel and George is that they like barely know each other and George apparently just felt like, ultimately, you know, George is just intimidated because he thought that Isabel was like, she like had the touch because she was his nurse when he was getting be better at some point um, recently. And she had to like kind of help keep him clean and stuff like that and like rub rub his back and certain things like that and he thought that that meant things and she was like I was doing my job are you kidding me so that's a thing but also he's kind of intimidated by it because he always comes across as this like dude who knows everything who has all the experience and is the best human on the face of the planet and he's not he's clearly very afraid and nervous and it kind of comes to him and, and shakes is that that's the plot <laughs> it's them trying to work through their relationships and things that they are keeping again things that they're keeping a secret honestly like George is just trying to avoid things he's like no it's okay I just got married but on my honeymoon night you know we are going to actually just go to my old war buddy's house and I'm going to talk to him about getting a, a cattle farm in Texas. Also, Ralph's house, the neighborhood, is built on top of where there's like a small cavern that the ground is just like slowly sinking into. What does that mean? I didn't get that. Like every once in a while there would be like a shake and then the ground would like settle a little bit. I'm not sure what the symbolism is. And what, what that represents exactly. Just realizing. Uh, and then the last play, The Night of the Iguana, which was the first play that I read in this. And it was like a good number of, probably like a couple weeks before I even read the other one. So this is the one that is least in my mind. You have Shannon, who used to be a priest, but he's like sort of been kicked out. <laughs> and then he is currently, oh my god, where are they? In Mexico? I think they're in Mexico. He's like a tour guide for people who come to Mexico. And there's this one like bar, hotel place that he, um, a hotel. It's a hotel. <laughs> there's a hotel that he goes to all the time where um, a friend of his is Maxine. 
who was my favorite character in this. I really liked her. There's a group of tourists. They're church people. Um, they're like a church group. They're a church group. <laughs> they're a church group. And there is a young lady there that uh, has fallen for Shannon. Things happen and then the church, the, one of the head ladies of the church group is like, he slept with a child. He's being destroyed. He's going to be destroyed. Which now that I think of it, is kind of like, are we supposed to be rooting for Shannon? No. We should not be rooting for Shannon. He basically runs away to the hotel that his friend, that Maxine runs, hides away there, like takes the keys to the bus, is like determined to stay there to try to figure out how to stop his further downfall. And then also um, there's a woman, Hannah, and her father who come, who also sort of get involved with things. Uh, but Hannah makes a, a, a companion, I guess, to Shannon. They're just spending time at the hotel while they're contemplating things, I guess. Then we have one more play, Anne of the Thousand Days by Maxwell Anderson. And this has to do with Anne Boleyn's time as a queen, but like kind of not really. It starts off and it's kind of like a prologue of her in the tower going to be executed soon uh beheaded you know as happened and then it goes back to when henry first started like courting and and deciding essentially that she would be his next love interest in a way just because i don't know how to phrase it because like i don't know if they were if he went in with the intentions of it being like a fling or if he was like, yeah, this is going to be my next wife, my next queen, even though he had to try to figure out how to not be with Catherine of Aragon anymore. Anyway, it kind of goes back and forth. It focuses on the relationship, though, between Henry and Anne. But then also, obviously, it has to do with a little bit of the trials that end up happening. And then she said, like, I'm just not sure what the point was. Especially because, of course, it's just a lot of speculation. <laughs> and then even further, like, on top of that, it's just... I just don't know. I just don't know what to think of it. Yeah, I'm not sure. But it also, I mean, it definitely made me want to... I kept having to go back and forth on, on online and look things up to see like, oh wait, when did this happen and, and who is this person and let's, how were they connected and things like that. Uh, and then it just made me want to like read more and uh, watch more pertaining to the Tudors. May think about picking up Hilary Mantel's Cromwell trilogy. Is that what it's called? What is it called? But you know, it's Wolf Hall bringing up the bodies. Is that the second one? And then the third one that I don't, I don't know the titles, but there's a really beautiful hardcover box set that I have my eye on. It's a little expensive, but I would like it. <laughs> I'm eyeing it. Um, and then lastly, lastly, we have a reread of The Woman in Black by Susan Hill. I just really wanted to reread this, um, especially because I'm interested in watching the movie again. I don't really remember it, but then I wanted to like refresh my memory on this story too. So, if I'm remembering correctly, they are different. They take different turns. Um, and this, I think I enjoyed more this time around. Susan Hill, this was written 1983. It's written so well as if it's actually a Victorian novella, which is when it, it takes place, is in the Victorian era. She does a really good job with that, just creating, having the same sort of uh, diction and structure as a Victorian work may be, but still being very accessible and still having some sort of modern air to it, I guess. Yeah, it was really good. I mean, not my favorite ghost story, I guess, but I'm glad I reread it and I liked it more this time around. I increased my rating. I had it at a three out of five previously, which I think was mostly just from memory, but I could be wrong about that. Um, like when I had initially rated it on Goodreads, it could have been um, like not in the moment of actually just finishing it. Um, and this time I gave it a four. It starts off Christmas Eve, of course, which is actually, I, did I start it on Christmas Eve? No, I think I actually started it after Christmas, but it starts off 
on Christmas Eve and um, the main character Arthur is with his family and they're telling ghost stories as they used to do. And Arthur starts to become like physically upset about this and he needs to step away. And this causes him to finally write down his story um, of something that happened to him. Sort of an event in his life, but also it sort of carried on after after the event sort of passed. And that's his time at Eel Marsh House. Alice Drablow is an old woman who lived at Eel Marsh House, and she recently died, and Arthur worked for a lawyer who was settling her affairs, and so Arthur was sent to Eel Marsh House to find, look at her papers and the house and her belongings and things like that. But when he is there, there are ghost sightings. He he has an experience at Eel Marsh House with a ghost. And things it's very short. Things happen from there, of course. Yes. <laughs> Glad I reread it. And then just as a side note here, that was the end of all the 35 books that I read in 2021, but I did start Perfume back in October. I am very much liking it. The, the description, the writing is so good, but I don't know why I'm like not picking it up. I don't know. I think maybe I'm just not feeling it like in this moment. I'm just like interested in other things right now. But I'm on page 110 and it's only like around 250 pages or something like that. Maybe a little more than, yeah, a little more than that. And I was thinking, I was like, okay, I could try to finish this. It was like, it was like New Year's Eve. I was like, I could try to finish Perfume and I can make my 36th book, you know, because that was like my goal was to read 36 books. Or I could start something else that's short or shorter and try to finish that. So that's what I decided to do. I decided to start The Crucible by Arthur Miller, which ended up taking me not so much time, but I only got 38 pages into it on New Year's Eve. Granted, it ended up being a fuller day than I expected. My mom had a friend over and she brought her daughter, who we had never met before, and the um, her son-in-law and granddaughter. So they were here and I, of course, didn't want to be rude. And then there was also a K-pop concert online. So I watched that and that was like three and a half hours. Oh my God. And so I just didn't have as much time to finish this on New Year's Eve as I wanted. Um, and then also I was just underlining so much. I have since finished it. Oh my God, it's so good, you guys. Read The Crucible. It's definitely like one of my favorite plays now. I'd have to make a list. Maybe I should do that. Maybe I should read some more plays this year and then have like a favorite plays list. I don't have that. <laughs> anyway, it was really good. But I mean, I only got 38 pages into it in 2021. So it was officially... Oh my gosh, this was officially the first book that I read, I guess, this year, huh? Yes, okay. I'm not going into the details of what they're about because eventually I will talk about them in videos for this year, whether that be like in, in the near future or towards the end of the year, which I definitely will mention them at the end of the year. And that's it. That was so much. Did that go as well as I wanted it to? I don't think so. But now I can finally start editing and that's good. That is how my reading went this year. Yeah, oh wait. I wanna stack all the books and see how what they look like. <laughs> I don't think I should do that. It looks dangerous actually. Oh my God, you guys, it's on my hair. <laughs> People do this all the time. This is really heavy. <gasps> I can't do it. <laughs> These are all the books I read. <laughs> and they're not even all of them because I read others on audiobook. I can't put these down. <laughs> This is a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, my hair is caught when I was stacking the books. Let's see. <sighs> nope, that's as far as I can go. Okay, I have to set it down on the ground. I'm not picking that back up again. <laughs> that was interesting. Tell me how your reading year went, please. And let me know if any of these books interest you or if you've read any of them things like that. So yeah, thank you for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye.